Let us open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you have given us your Son as the ultimate revelation of you. As we contemplate not only uh, Jesus directly this Advent season, but as we look at him through other things, like through Moses and the burning bush and the stories of the, the Exodus, I pray that you would reveal to us truer and fuller meaning of what it means to have God with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, Luke. My mom says the sound is so low she can't understand. So she still can't hear me? No. Maybe I should switch it back then. Okay, well. <laughs> Let me see if I can switch this back. No, Luke, it's fine. It's my mistake. Oh, okay. Well, it's I'm good. I hearing my phone now, which is part of why yeah. it's louder. But <laughs> no, I can I can hear you just fine. Yeah, it was me. All right, if I put it right here. Can you still hear me? Because this is where I had it before. So I think you need to just bring it closer. All right, well, let's bring it up here then. Okay, so as I said, uh, we've got the Bible study sheet, uh, our verse of the day. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Hebrews 3, verse 3. Okay, and so to understand chapter 3, you can't forget about chapters 1 and 2, which is really awkward for us, which we've had kind of a bit of a break since we did our chapters 1 and 2. And so I wanted to remind you of what we talked about in chapters 1 and 2. Uh, to do that, though, we're going to first do a review, and then we'll look at some more of the specifics, okay? So again, who wrote the letter to the Hebrews? We don't know. Good job. Okay. <laughs> but what then... Yeah, we suspect someone uh, familiar with the Apostle Paul and or the Apostle Paul himself. Um, we suspect it was someone that had some ties or direct knowledge of the church in Rome. Um, but again, all of these are just suspects from the text because the church fathers themselves uh, talk about different people who they thought it was. Uh, and the church itself had issues with the letter to the Hebrews because of its anonymous nature, okay? Um, the what then, uh, what does the letter of Hebrews talk about? Remember, the, the reason we call it the letter of the Hebrews is because of its main context of the what, right? It is constantly talking about all of these Old Testament things that point us to their greatest fulfillment in Christ. Okay, so the what is really looking at the Old Testament, looking at the Jewish scriptures and pointing us to Christ. Uh, when do you think this was written? Yeah, around 70 AD. And the reason we use that number is because... Um, one, the when's often tied to the author, so you can't really pin it down. But the content of the letter seems to imply that the, that the temple has not been destroyed yet, which would have happened in 70 AD. Uh, that being said, there's ways of viewing that and still getting it older um, or newer, I guess. Uh, so anywhere from 50 to 90 AD is a potential date in this. Uh, and then the where. Where is the main location that we're talking about here? Rome. And so, again, the way I take it is this is most likely a letter written to Rome, but you could argue that it was a letter written from Rome as well. Okay? And then the why. What's the, the ultimate reason why this letter was written? Probably the of the Jewish that still have I wouldn't say that, actually, is its ultimate reason. It does talk about law, but I wouldn't say that it's its ultimate purpose. 
Yeah. yeah, to elevate Jesus, right? The entire purpose of the letter is to show that Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God, okay? Which does imply a lot of things with the law. But the main point, though, isn't that the law isn't going to get you there. The main point is that Jesus is going to get you there, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? All right, so now looking at the, the pictures that I've got here. Again, I stole this from that Bible overview uh, video that we watched. In verse, in chapter one, right, we started off with just the, the description of Jesus and who he is and what he is. You know, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors in many different ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. And then it talks about how Jesus is the radiance of the Father, the exact imprint of God. You know, just really focusing on the importance of Jesus. And then continuing on there, he starts comparing Jesus to the angels, okay? And talking about how Jesus is so much superior to the angels. Why were the angels a big deal to the Jews? They were them, gave a message. Yeah. Think about what we talked about in the sermon today. The angel of the Lord came to Moses in the burning bush. The angel of the Lord was in the pillar of fire and cloud that led the Israelites around the, Mount, the, the, the wilderness. The angel of the Lord covered the top of Mount Sinai with the cloud of thick darkness, or was the cloud of thick darkness, depending on how you, on how you uh, read that. So what's with this? So it sounds like the Jews are already familiar with the angel of the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and so, but what did we talk about in the sermon today? This isn't just your average angelic created being, right? Look at how the the angel of the Lord is spoken to. It's re, you know the people addressing Moses when he addresses the burning bush. He's he's speaking to God. It says right, and not just an angelic messenger. And so all of these angels of the Lord point us again to Christ as the ultimate fulfillment and revelation. Because, yeah, this amorphous cloud is really neat and shows God's presence. But it doesn't really, really tell you much about God other than, wow, God's an amorphous cloud. But God in Jesus can have a conversation with you, he can sit down with you can talk to the disciples when they said, Jesus, we don't get this parable. Can you explain it to us? Jesus, teach us to pray. You know, all these, the ultimate revelation is God in man, in the, in the person of Jesus, okay? And so the, the comparison to the angels is, well, yeah, angels were a big deal in the Old Testament. They did massive things. Exactly. But this one is unique. This one's even more important than the angels. So that's what we spent chapters one and two on, okay? And so now as we get to chapter three, we're, we're switching gears a little bit, which is why at the beginning of chapter three, verse one, he starts with the word, therefore. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, okay? In other words, we've already considered the angels. We've already considered, you know, Jesus as God. Now, Therefore, consider Jesus, and we're going to compare him now to Moses, okay? Um, before we do that, though, I do want to read the what's going on here. Okay, a glance back at the Old Testament will provide the historical setting for this section of Hebrews. The people of Israel took 40 years to accomplish what could have been done in about two weeks. Why did it take them so long? Unbelief. They decided to follow their own way instead of God's way. Sin deceived them into thinking they knew better than God. That led to hardening of their hearts. The writer clearly states the consequences and punishment of sin. While Israel could have li been living a healthy life in a land flowing with milk and honey, the people instead lay dead in the wilderness as God administered divine discipline. Clearly, Clearly, the Lord is displeased with every act of disobedience, rebellion, and unbelief. The warning of this lesson comes to us fresh today, as fresh today as it came almost 2,000 years ago. 
God realizes that we need the kind of warning that will keep us alert to the things we cannot afford to forget. Okay? Yeah. It keeps talking in the Bible about he's coming soon. Come on, come on. Be ready. Mm-hmm. Be ready. Mm-hmm. Come right away. Well, it hasn't happened yet. Well, yeah, I know. Maybe it's because we're not doing such a solid job of following just like it talks about here. They could have gone across that desert two weeks. But no, it's about 40 years because they didn't quite have it right. <coughs> Maybe we don't quite have it right. In our day and society, you know, yeah. Well, and I would say that's that's an apt statement. In fact, the, the New Testament even says that God is patient with us, not even yeah. not wanting any to perish, but to have the hope of everlasting life. Yeah. And so. We got to work it out. Yeah. <laughs> I got a comment to follow today. So uh-huh. it just it, his uh, mentioning it just uh, kind of drove it. What do you think, Pastor? I think the, the Christianity is a descending order in the United States and Europe. Is the rest of the world more than making up for uh, for, for our uh, downfall? Do you think? I think statistically, yes, that's a, that's a true statement. Yeah, the, every single church denomination in the United States, with the exception of the Pentecostals, by the yeah, way, I know. which okay, I know. Uh, but with every uh, every other church body is on decline. Like statistically, we're percentage-wise, we are declining in membership. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, if you want to throw a little, you know, rose-colored lens on there, the conservative churches, like ourselves and the Catholics and some other uh, more conservative Christian churches, are declining at a smaller percentage than the other ones. So there's your rose-colored glasses. <laughs> Still decline, which is no good. Uh, but here's the thing, though. Africa, South America, China, oh, yeah. and several other yeah. Southeast and other Asian countries are actually more than making yeah. up for yeah. our decline. Yeah. To the point of in Africa, they send missionaries back to the United States yeah. right now. Yeah. You know, and so it's it's interesting because as a world population, Christianity is on the rise, but as a European and North and North American uh, uh, continent discussion, it is on the decline. It's frightening yeah. to think of the decline in the United States. If God is not happy. No, no. Well, and I don't think God is ever desiring for the church to decline. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, God works even through decline. Um, there are periods of time where the church grows the best. After it's had decline and is under persecution and things like that. Look at the start of the church, for example. Yeah. The fastest growing time of the church, I mean, who knows exactly numbers-wise, but seemingly the fastest would be the New Testament period. That first 50 years after Jesus died, the church was exploding. You know, they're talking about 2,000 people came to Christ that day. And this whole household came to Christ that day and all this stuff because God was having an impact. And I'm not saying that, that those same numbers don't happen. But Jesus himself said that we will do even greater works yeah, than him. And I don't think it's a matter of individual work being greater, but the multitude of the works yeah, yeah. would be greater. Yeah. Um, Interesting little thing I read in a book uh, on my drive. I, I do audiobooks to keep me awake. And one of the books I did was, it's called a 12 Hard Questions for Christianity or something like that. And they, they introduced the book by the question of, well, isn't Christianity on decline? And they say, well, actually, no. Atheism is on decline. And the way and the numbers they, they focus on is the fact that religion in general is actually a, is actually going to be a larger proportion of the world in the next fifty years than it is right now. Not necessarily Christian religion, but religion. Let me I'm getting there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so and here's how they here's how they say that. 
they're not talking about, you know, witnessing or, you know, all that. They're just simply looking at birth statistics. Christians and Muslims have more kids than secularists and atheists. To the point that atheism and secularism will have declined almost 10% in the next 50 years, purely looking at birth numbers, whereas Christianity and, and Islam will have increased several percentage points. And I think they still have Christianity as being the number one, but they, they by their birth certificate, statistics only have it being the number one by a couple percentage points above Islam um, in the next 50 years. They even have like the percentage of children born into a Christian home who become atheists is drastically lower. She can't, she can't let me get no. that. She's, she's, like, she's like, lower. you already told me this, and I know it's so fun. <laughs> it's drastically lower than the number of so, atheist people whose children will see. So here's the, here's the other thing. Uh, a secularist or an atheist household is... 40% of their children are, are statistically going to become Christian. In a Christian household, only 20% of their children are statistically going to become atheist or secularist. In other words, you know, the secularist doesn't mean, it's kind of like saying agnostic. It means, yeah, maybe there's something out there, but who cares because all that we care about is the world we live in. Um, that's a secularist, um, which means a secularist or atheist couple is twice as likely to have a Christian child as a Christian couple is to have an atheist or secularist child, which is, which is another fun little statistic. So is the church on decline? Not really. Is it in decline in America specifically? Yes. Um, but if you just go off of those birth numbers, those birth numbers hold true for America also, which means in 50 years, America is going to be potentially a more religious, more Christian nation, you know, than, than we are now. Yeah. So it, 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 it's fascinating when you start looking at those numbers. Um, does not does not mean anything, really, when you think about our duty right here and now. Because our duty right here and now is to share the gospel, right? And so whether you have zero kids or 12 kids, it doesn't change your duty. Your duty is to share the gospel, right? You know, that's the great mission. Go, therefore, into the world, right, and make disciples by baptizing and teaching, right? Yeah. This is an opportunity to make a glimpse of God's plan. You know, once in a while, something will happen in your life and you say, wow, that was pretty cool. Um, I saw the hand of an angel there. Something happened that shouldn't happen, but it did. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's a little glimpse that something's going on behind the scenes here. Maybe this day that constructed I mean, and who knows? Maybe it's part of God's plan to breed out the unbelievers. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so yeah, so to answer your question, yes and no. Yeah, and yeah. I really appreciate your little uh, explanation of all this. We yeah. need to know that. And it is encouraging. Mm -hmm. There, I mean, if you just look at oh, the, my. if you just look at the Lutheran church, and I, I'm not even talking about like, the people who call themselves Lutheran but really aren't Lutheran. I mean, the actual, like, people who confess the Book of Concord, yeah. Africa has, like, I think it's, I mean, in just one country in Africa has two to three times as many Lutherans than America. Like, just Lutherans. I'm talking about all the other denominations, just specifically Lutheran. There are more Lutherans in Africa than America by an order of magnitude. Yep. <laughs> I mean, and that's just one denomination. You know, it's it's crazy. Yeah. Was that in the late 1900s that they really exploded? I couldn't tell you when the when the when the numbers started changing, but oh, okay. yeah, that's it's that's the current day numbers are astounding. You know, in the LCMF, there's about two million members. Right. 
in individual countries of Africa, there's 4 million and 6 million. Yeah. And when I say Lutherans, I, I'm actually talking like these church bodies are in altar and pulpit fellowship with us. Right. To the point of their pastor could come and preach and we'd have no problems with it. Right. You know, uh, which we can't say for many church bodies. <laughs> I, I can't allow a Catholic priest to come up here and preach. I can't allow a Baptist pastor to come up here and preach because of our fundamental disagreements about the Christian faith. Uh, and so, yeah, I can do that with several of our, our African brothers and sisters. <laughs> well, not sisters, but brothers in Christ, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, so can, can we, we're going to keep going if that's okay. Is it, a, is it, a, okay, go ahead. Other and know that we've got a, a group here, a figure we're probably a little more kind of devoted on things with the Bible study stuff. That we really want to win. And and I find that if I have people giving me input, giving me ideas, if people are even just interested, even just telling the book you had, speak boldly, it's an excellent book by a pastor or a denomination. Mm-hmm. It, it, it helps us to. church is not a church in this single congregation. You know, the church is a universal church. We're talking about, you know, all Christianity across all the planet. And we take support from that. That's one of the reasons I encourage the, 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 the youth, the high school youth to go to the National Youth Gathering, because they're off their lonesome little, you know, massive three youth here at this congregation. And then they go and they stand in the midst of 25,000 other teenagers. I mean, that's uplifting. That's encouraging. That's inspiring. Yeah. Uh, And so, yeah, in terms of uh, uh, praying that we abide by that and do that. Yeah. Um, If you can remind me at the end, we'll put that in our prayer at the end today specifically. Okay. 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 So, therefore, consider Jesus. Right? Verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more glory than, or, sorry, than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. We're going to stop there and we'll see if we get to the rest later. But um, for now, okay, so again, it's... uh, Grinding gears, switch topics here. The therefore consider Jesus in comparison to Moses. And when he says consider, this word is, you know, kind of notice, observe, contemplate. That's all the ways you can translate this word. This is not just a, oh, you know, here's a random thought. No, dwell on that thought. Dwell on this consideration. Take special notice. Obs- you know, observe, you know, in a, almost a scientific fashion, contemplate what this could mean for us and for you specifically, okay? Why? What's so special about him, especially what they talked about in, in, that precedes chapter 3? Why? We already kind of talked about this, but why? Why are we doing this? He's superior. He's the radiance of God's glory. Yeah, he's superior to angels. He's you know he's the radiance of God's glory. He is God, the exact imprint of God, right? In other words, because he's a big deal, right? <laughs> Why are we talking about him? Well, because look at all we've talked about already, and now who are we going to talk about in comparison to Moses? 
which think about a Jew. Who is kind of the ultimate guy for the Jews? Moses, right? Multiple times, the Jews accused Jesus. Are you, are you more important than the, than the people, who, than Moses who gave us the law? And Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> I am Lord of the Sabbath even. I am all these things. You know? <laughs> and that, you know, of course, what does that cause the Jews to do? Just blow their heads with anger and fury over this man and his claims, right? That's why they crucified him. Because he was literally speaking blasphemy, in their opinion, at least, right? Exactly, and they were fully in their rights to crucify any man who says these things. It just so happened that this wasn't just a man, right? Okay, who was this man then? Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Apostle and high priest. Think about those offices. How is this a fitting description of Jesus? Okay. Exactly. So what was the purpose of a high priest? To intercede between man and God, right? Yeah. Uh, Luther Luther had a fun way of doing this. He said a uh, a priest represents people to God, right? What does an apostle do? The other way around. He represents God to the people. Think about that. What is the purpose of an apostle? To teach, to show. The word actually means sent one. An apostle is the person who is sent with an official decree or designation to go proclaim a specific message. So if you were an apostle for a king, then you would go forth and you would tell the kingdom about the king's decree for that kingdom. Right? Maybe it's a specific ordinance. Hear ye, hear ye, on the eve of tomorrow there shall be a ball. Or maybe it's something more important than that. Hear ye, hear ye, whoever doesn't pay taxes is going to jail. You know? Right? You think about the apostles of kings, right? How is Jesus then an apostle? Well, yeah, but how? How is he an apostle? Who is he an apostle to? He's the exact representation of God. He's the exact representation of God. Yeah. So go back to verse 2, okay? Chapter 3, verse 2. Jesus was faithful to him who appointed him. Who's him? God the Father, right? Yeah, Jesus was faithful to the Father who sent Jesus for this purpose, right? To be an apostle on his behalf to the world. You know, Paul jokes about the super apostles in some of his letters. Well, Jesus is the only super apostle. He's the only apostle that can do everything and be everything and fulfill everything that he was sent to do. Um, Unfortunately, the rest of the apostles were all sinners. Paul himself calls himself the chief of sinners. And you don't have to look too far in the gospel to find the part where Peter sinned. Jesus himself had to say, get behind me, Satan, talking to Peter. Right? Well, the other apostles did a good a good job, obviously. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the faith shared among us. But they weren't Jesus, right? Okay? Um, and so, again, an apostle is someone who represents God to the people, and a priest is someone who represents people to God. Okay? Doesn't the high priest also offer the sacrifice in Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, so basically, the, if you want to think of this in terms of representing people to God, the high priest's job was to sacrifice not only on his behalf, but on the behalf of the people, and then kind of in a symbolic and real sense, he would then present these people who were just forgiven to God in the Holy of Holies. 
Okay, that was the Day of Atonement. That's when he would actually go, the one day of the year where he was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. The high priest would go in there, and he would then present these people who just had their sins forgiven, and who, you know, just had his own sins forgiven. He would then present these people to a holy God, asking for not only forgiveness, but also for blessings and intercessions and, and all those things. Yeah. Does our church still remember that particular day of the festival? What day is that? The, the day, day of atonement? I couldn't even tell you. I know. Yeah, it's, I know it's a specific day, but I don't remember it's, which. It's early October, near my birthday. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. John Cooper. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. that's a little bit Yeah. Well, again, because now we are all priests before God, right? We all have been atoned. We've all had our sins forgiven. We don't yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, a similar way we remember this is when you see me doing this in church. Mm-hmm. That's me acting as your priest before God. I'm taking your prayers and sending them up to God. That's the that's the sim- symbolism of this. They call it the Ron's position. That's the symbolism of it. Um, does that mean you can't do that position and represent yourself to God? No, you can, because you're now you know part of the priesthood of all believers. But in a public forum, where you've appointed a one individual person to represent you publicly, that's why the pastor does that for you on your behalf. Okay. In the same way. Christ represents us to God, okay? Um, And now we get into this, in the end of verse 3, we get into this, you know, who appointed him, just as Moses also, right? Moses also was appointed. Moses also was faithful in all God's house, okay? What is God's house? The church. The church, yes. And no. All believers, yeah. It depends what you mean by by the word church, right? Do you mean this building? No, the people. The people, yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. So when we talk about God's house, um, I'll try to do this without getting ahead of my sermon for next week. Um, What is God's house in the Old Testament? The tabernacle, right? Where did God dwell among his people? In the tent, in the tabernacle, eventually in the the uh, uh, temple, the temple, right? Um, what about the New Testament? What is God's house in the New Testament? A little more specifically. Yeah, more specifically, though. Okay, Sunday school answer. Jesus. Jesus destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it, right? God's house in the New Testament is Jesus. That's where God dwells with his people, okay? Why are we keep saying us now, then? Because we are the body of Christ, mm-hmm. right? Because the church, the, all believers are the body of Christ here on earth, okay? And so now we ourselves are God dwelling among his people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so we, talk, <clears throat> so we talk about God's house, right? Moses is part of that, right? Moses was a believer, but he was an especially faithful believer in all of God's house, right? I mean, not that he didn't, again, have his issues. For example, God said, speak to this rock and bring forth water. And Moses gets so upset, he hits the rock. And then God give, you know, throws him a bone and brings forth water anyway. But what does that, have, what does that mean for Moses after that? He, can't go to the he doesn't get to go to the promised land. But still considered one of the most faithful people in God's house, right? That brings up a question. 
Let me, well, she has, oh, yeah, Diana had her hand up first, so that's good. For Moses, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love the fact that, you know, Moses' journey, so to speak, for to be faithful in God's house started in the water. Yeah. <laughs> or started in the baptismal font. <laughs> so all this water he would drink in. God is just, you feel like at times God just sits up there thinking, huh, here's a fun thing I can do. You know, it's, it's not that these aren't real historical events. It's that I think God literally just has fun with history. <laughs> like, here's a fun thing I can do. Yeah. Okay, now what was your comment? In the sermon today, in the text sermon today, in the text today, I don't know if it's one of the sermon somewhere it says that Moses sung God, Jesus, in the bush, mm-hmm. and he was promised that he would come back to that mountain top to serve God for something. Well, we didn't get that far in the text, but that is the continuation of our Exodus text. It didn't have that specifically in our text. Did it? I didn't think it, it went that far. I thought it stopped before it got there. This will be the sign to you. You will worship me on this mountain. Did we get that far? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there it is. Verse 12. Okay, you're right. So it does get there. Uh, but, yeah, so that's... Did Moses go to that mountain? That's where he received the Ten Commandments. Yeah, the whole people went there, too. Yeah, the whole nation of Israel went there. Yeah, that's Mount Sinai, yeah. Well, it's in, in Horeb. Yeah, that's the region. Yeah, so, so where does it say? It says, uh, the priest of Midian is led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Okay, so when you talk about the, the, the Sinai mountain range, the, the Horeb mountain of God and Mount Sinai are basically the same because it's like that's the mountain, but it's the Sinai, it's, it's the, the, the larger mountain range is also referred to as Sinai. When they talk about the wilderness of Sinai, they're talking about him, you know, taking his sheep around the mountains and all that stuff. Yeah. From the same place. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So builder, so was faithful in all God's house. And then in verse 3, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Okay, in other words, yeah, Moses was faithful in all of God's house, but look at Jesus. He's literally the builder of God's house. Okay, literally creation is through Jesus, and all believers are through Jesus. Okay, Um, but the builder of all things is God, okay? Um, When we talk about the builder of all things, again, we're not talking about just, you know, the six days of creation. We're talking about all the creative endeavors of mankind as well throughout the ages, okay? All the innovations, all the political systems, all the, you know, hey, let's do this this way. God has credit for all of that because God himself is the one who inspires and gives us the ability to create. Hence, that's part of our imaging God. We bear the image of God, part of our image bearing. Okay? I think all these new things that are being created are just finally man has started to figure out the purpose of how God started to edit the So in, the, in that book I, I listened to, this drive. Uh, they talk about, isn't Christianity the downfall of science? No. Christianity is the reason we left the Dark Ages. Because mankind looked at the Bible and they said, huh, this is a God of order. This is a God of, you know, of, of rules and laws. I wonder what those rules and laws are for the, for the world around us. And so, literally, Christianity is the reason we have modern science. Because it was Christians who looked at the world around them and said, you know, if our God's a God of order, 
I bet you there's a reason why this stuff keeps happening. I bet you there's a reason why when I touch this sick person, I get sick. I bet you there's a reason why when I boil this water, it boils at the same temperature. I bet you there's a reason why. And that's the advent of science. Now, here's where science went off the rails, right? When suddenly man took God out of the equation and said, oh, the world has rules and order and laws. God's not the reason for it. It's up to us to put that order in. It's up to us to determine that order, to categorize. And, do all. and that's where that's where mankind fell off the rails. Okay? Yeah. Kind of building a pitiful tower of Babel. Yeah. Same thing, right? You know, why did they do it? Because they wanted to point the world to themselves and away from God's decree to subdue the earth and multiply. Right? They wanted to make a name for themselves gather people to themselves, right? Look what we can do. We can bake a brick. <laughs> At least that's the theory for that. It's, we can bake a brick now. Let's build a tower out of these baked bricks. No. Remember when God sent the flood, he also made a promise that was it. This is not. Mm-hmm. So we got the reason. He made a promise that was it. Not so much a promise, he just reinforced his previous command. You know, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Yeah. So are we cruising for a tyrant of Babel again? Do we start saying, look it up, look it up, we made transistors. We got radios now. We got cell phones now. We can go to the moon. Well, I think so. I mean, I've told this, this, this joke here before. You know, science advances to the pinnacle of achievement, and they can literally form a man from dirt. And so they go to God and say, you know, God, we don't need you anymore. We're going to have an old-fashioned man-making contest. And God says, let's go. Let's do it. And so the scientist bends down to get his cup full of dirt, and God says, get your own dirt. <laughs> yeah. But really, God, the first is that this tower of Babel gave different languages to keep us out of trouble. Well, I think, yeah, I think that's part of it. I think he literally, yeah, it's, it's viewed as a punishment, but it's a punishment that enabled us to better fulfill his original mandate to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so in all God's house, he's a servant, I'm in, in verse 5, to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, and indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Okay, how do we, like Moses, show that we are faithful? Notice the word faithful. I I put it in bold a couple times on there. How do we, like Moses, show that we are faithful? So we show ourselves faithful by doing good? By doing good, right? Following God's commands, isn't that doing good? You don't want to say it, but that's what you're trying to say. <laughs> what does it say here at the end of verse 6? That's that's still talking about Moses there and, and of Jesus, yeah? What's the end of verse 6? And we are his house. How? In our hope. In other words, not by our actions, but by our faith, by holding fast our confidence and our boasting in what? In our hope. What is hope? What is the hope in? Salvation through Christ. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so how do we like Moses show that we're faithful? Well, by having faith. We show we're faithful by simply trusting God, by holding fast to our confidence, you know, by hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Okay, and this word boasting, it's not a negative boasting. It's simply just taking pride in something, okay? Taking pride in what's been given to you. You know, some people might boast about their children. Well, most of the time they're not boasting about, you know, 
necessarily what they themselves have done, but what their child is capable of, you know, or, you know, they're proud of the aspects of that. And so this is not a, this isn't meant to be a negative boasting. This is meant to just simply take pride in what God's given you, right? God gave you hope. Be happy. Be prideful of that. Be happy. That's literally the word gospel is a reflection of that boasting and pride. Yes, we won. Right? That's the gospel. We won. Christ won. He beat the devil. He beat death. Yes. That's boasting, but it's a it's a positive boasting, right? Yeah. I've got to uh, give a good line on the faithfulness. Okay. Well, once upon a time, a long time ago, in a place far, far away, I was sitting in the Holy Cross Lutheran Church, listening to uh, Paul Hoffman preach. He's was all Hoffman's son, and he was Gary Thurst's roommate in the uh, seminary. And as the sermon was getting to a, 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 a high, friendly pitch, the pastor uh, Hoffman said, we are not called to be successful. We're called to be faithful. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I'll never forget that. Yeah. No, it's very true. Because think about it. We're not called to be successful. We're called to be faithful. God does not say that we're going to have success right. in proclaiming the gospel. In fact, Jesus warns us of all the unsuccessful things we're going to have to go through, right? The persecutions, the the negative aspects of of, you know, telling the world that, they're wrong, right? Yeah. And yet, if Jesus was killed for doing those very things, yeah. why should we expect yeah. much, you know, anything different? And yet he says that the gospel is always going to do what he wants to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My for instance, in those statistics we started Yeah. And, and even if those statistics start saying something else, does that mean that God's wrong? No. It means that we can't see God's plan, and we just have to be faithful. Exactly. Just wait till we get to Hebrews 11. We'll read it. <laughs> By faith, right? Yeah. Half of you are going to get some half, the other half of you are going to win great victories. <laughs> when you get up there, you say, all right, I want all along to want to get some final half on my left side. I'll all along to shut them up, the lions get on my right side. Yeah. Volunteers. Yeah. Potentially at this time we've already got garden lanterns happening among the Christians. Mm. For Nero's garden party parties where yeah. he put Christians yeah. in cages and light them on fire to light his garden party. Well, well look at Martin Luther and <laughs> Nobody could lay a finger on Martin Luther. That guy was successful in everything he did. But you don't want to get statistical about it. Mm. Yeah. John Haas. John proclaimed the same thing. He was, tell, he was telling the Catholic Church the exact same thing that Martin Luther was. He got burnt at the stake, yeah. and ashes then got scattered into the river that ironically flew or flowed right past Martin Luther's stomping grounds. Uh, and Martin Luther, then successful. Why? Well, because God had time and purpose for his mission at that time and place. Which, yes, we know from a human perspective, well, there's a printing press now. It's a lot harder to silence a printing press than to silence an individual man, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's not that it's dependent on us saying things just right in our way, in our style. It's God's word that will do mm-hmm. it. And I think that's really important because, again, you know, we get so nervous about, oh, no. I'm not going to be able to say this right. You know, I'm not going to be able to do this right. And and so a lot of people say, oh, oh send them to pastor, right? <laughs> I don't know if that's always the best strategy. I'm a pastor of a congregation. I'm not a friend of the person you just sent me to. Not yet, at least. I mean, potentially I could be a friend, but I don't know the guy or the girl. You do. You know what resonates with them. You know what they're, what they're uh, you know, you know, their background story will will key them into. You know, you know how to talk to them. Just talk to them. You been. don't have to say, oh, I'm an expert. Here's the answer. No, you said, you know, I've been wondering that same thing. 
And here's what I've come to understand, and I don't know if it's right, but, you know, it's really helped me. Uh-huh. They're, not, they're just looking to talk as a friend, right? Just be a friend. Yeah. You didn't know what to say. Well, and that ver- that thing that you're saying, I would argue, is the exact right thing to say at that moment in time, whether it is an answer or whether it is, uh, I don't know, let's look into this. Why don't we meet over coffee and, you know, we'll both bring our Bibles and or a Google search, you know, see what we can find. got to be careful with Google searches sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that the exact same thing that Moses I don't know what to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Again, within that too, the, the other side of that is, you know, God doesn't pick people based upon their capabilities and their performance. He gives capabilities and performance to the people He picks. But he doesn't yeah. call the qualified who qualified the qualified. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. There's the fifty way of saying it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> God doesn't call the qualified. He calls qualified the call. Yeah. Yes, and we're also the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit can tell us to do. I, I can't tell you the number of times. I didn't know what to say. I said, Holy Spirit was to pray and tell me what to say. And, and he did. And, and it, while there was a gal, she didn't understand what grace was. That started the whole conversation. And we were going to pray like she was going to receive Jesus, but I knew she didn't understand. And and I and he told me to say when I asked him, it's nothing that you can do. That hit the spot for her. I mean, we talked extensively on grace up to that point. Mm-hmm. And, and then the light came. Yeah. So he'll give you what it is for that specific person. I wasn't saying we always want to have little rose crazy and well, and, and again, there's nothing wrong with memorizing things to help. You know, there's nothing wrong with especially digging into Scripture to help. Um, but don't be nervous about it. You know, God gives you knowledge. God encourages you to study his word. You know, he, he basically, you know, made it a generational commandment for the Israelites that you should teach your children these things. You should write them on your doorpost and wear them on your clothing and even uh, adhere them above your foreheads and all this stuff. Uh, God wants us to know this stuff. God wants us to study his word, but at the same time, God doesn't want us to be anxious about what to say. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on the first six verses before we move on to verse seven? (laughs) There's a lot of content here, okay? <laughs> we haven't even gotten into the quotation, the Old Testament quotations yet, but yeah. All right. So, therefore, right? In other words, you got Moses, you got this example of Moses being greater than Jesus, all these things. What? Oh, sorry. So the back here. Jesus being greater than Moses. Good catch. <laughs> yeah. um, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Here's our warning, okay? Therefore, if all this was true, then... We also need to learn from the lessons of the past as well. Okay? How did the people test God in the Exodus? Oh man, we had food in Egypt, they had all the cool stuff around the face. <laughs> <laughs> the stinking manna. Yeah. <laughs> Literally bread from heaven. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Wimps out, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Someone else had their hands up. They, they were crying out for water and they made themselves an idol. Yeah. Yeah. Moses, you're taking too long to come down the mountain. Here's this golden calf. This golden calf brought you out of out of Egypt. Here's this pile of gold, and this is just what came out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right. So 
let's first go to Exodus chapter 17, 1 to 7, okay? Here's a specific test of the people towards God. So Exodus 17, verses 1 to 7. Okay. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and taking your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I'll stand before you there on the rock of the Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Notice this is not the same incident that got Moses barred from the promised land. In this one, God did tell Moses to strike the rock. Later on in the book of Numbers, he tells Moses, go speak to the rock. And Moses instead, shall I bring water from this rock for you? And he strikes it. He has to strike it three times. <laughs> it just didn't happen the first time. Um, but anyway, so what's happening here? How did the people test God? Yeah, is he really with us, right? Yeah. They didn't trust him, right? We're thirsty. There's no water here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was the outcome? They got their water. People complained. They sin. Their the entire name of the place means rebellion and quarreling with uh, and uh, testing. Massa means testing. Meribah means rebellion or quarreling. Okay. Well, this the end result of this wasn't that yet. Um, that was the the whole uh, Jordan thing. Um, ultimately, though, what happens? God gives them water to remind them that God will take care of his children, right? Okay? So what was the outcome? Well, they sinned. They they sinned against God, and yet God was kind and faithful to them. So many times in the book of Exodus, it talks about God wanting to just literally wipe the slate clean, and, you know, Moses, I'll make a nation out of you. And Moses is like, ah, let's not do that, God, which is an interesting way of seeing how God puts people in place to actually encourage, you know, what he's already said he would do. This is a whole other branch of, of theology we're not going to get into today. Okay? Now, let's look deeper at this psalm, okay? Open up your Bibles to Psalm 95. That's where this is taken from. Interesting, because you read this, these verses 8 through 11 here in Hebrews, which are the last half of this Psalm 95, okay? Notice how Psalm 95 starts off. We actually sing this as part of Matins, okay? O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Can you hear the, the music just going in your head right now? Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. I can't do it right now. Yeah, yeah so we like that, right? Yeah. Okay, so we, we know this song, but in Matins we don't sing the last part. Right? Um, yeah. 
For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in Meribah, the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put you to the proof, though they had seen my, seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, there are people who will go, oh, we should sing that part, right? <laughs> um, Notice, though, how this psalm really comes out, right? Look at all of what God has done. Look what we have done in response, right? Let us make a joyful noise to God because look what he's done or look what we've deserved in the past, right? We've done all this nasty stuff, right? We've rebelled. We tested. We quarreled. We did all these things, right? Um, you know, harden your hearts. When your fathers put me to the test. And then for 40 years I loathed that generation, said there are people who will go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Right? Can you imagine that? And yet... What does this psalm teach us? Teaches us the stakes are high, right? Exactly. In other words, the, the author of Hebrews is using this psalm very appropriately, right? Because it was a warning in this psalm as well. You know, this was legitimately something they sang in the... Uh, in the temple or thereabouts, right? They did sing this. They sang both parts. They sang both parts, yeah. They sang verse two, right? <laughs> um, and so when you think about this, this very much has uh, a law and gospel approach to the message, right? You know, what's the law here, both in Hebrews and in this psalm? Yeah, don't put God to the test. Don't Quarrel, don't rebel against him, but do what? Trust, Trust him. Exactly. Right? Uh, I, I got something in the footnote of Concordia. A call to acknowledge by submissive attitude and obedient heart the Lord's kingship over his people. Is this the take care? Is that? Well, What's your note? What verse is your note from? Oh, for the whole psalm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, take, yeah, take care. You know, do what, yeah, 6 through 11. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. All right. Notice all the, the focus here, too. Is This is creator God. This is the God who made us, and therefore, we kind of are obligated to do what we're created to do, right? And when we don't do that, that's called sin. Okay. But that same God who is our creator, but is on my side, is also the God of our salvation. Mm -hmm. Which is how we can sing to the Lord and make a joyful noise, right? Yeah. So, same thing for us when we talk about law and gospel, right? Okay, these are, Luther makes a big deal out of law and gospel. Walter, you know, one of our founding fathers of the specifically the Missouri Synod, makes a big deal out of law and gospel, right? When you use law and gospel, you have to understand what you're doing, okay? The law is meant to return us to God, to bring about repentance, to show us our sin, the whole SOS analogy. The law shows us our sin. The gospel shows us our Savior, okay? That's the SOS analogy for law and gospel, okay? Uh, when we talk about this law and gospel side, we need to focus on... Or, what does that mean for us in our proclamation? It means that if someone's doing something wrong, especially if it's already a Christian, then we need to bring the law to bear upon their heart. We need to tell them, hey, this is wrong. This is contrary to God's will. This is contrary to God's law. And you need to stop it. You need to repent. People like to say, oh, you know, judge not lest ye be judged. Well, yes, 
except God also tells us to confront our brothers and sisters with the law to keep them in God's word, to bring about repentance. Because if you continue walking away from God's word, God's law, you're eventually going to walk away from the faith. Okay? In contrast, if you've got a Christian brother or sister who is burdened by the law and thinks, man, I just can't get anything right. I just can't do this. I can't love my neighbor. I just, I am a really horrible Christian, and I don't know why God would ever want me. You then put more law on top of that? No. That's when you show them the gospel. That's when you help them to make a joyful noise to the Lord, the God of their salvation. Right? That's when you show them the Savior. That's when you say, hey, yeah, you're right. Praise be to God that he did it for you. Because it's not on you. Which is a seemingly paradox, right? God expects this of us, but yet God knows we're going to fail, and so he sent his son to save us. Right? Apparently he made us capable of doing that until that apple incident. And all of a sudden, Yeah. Yeah. So it, it is a, it's, it's hard, but when you think about law and gospel and you're reading through scripture, sometimes it's very helpful to, to think about those two categories in your various scriptural passages. You know, even something as simple as literally the Mount Sinai where God's giving the law, there's all sorts of gospel in there. The entire covenantal statement that God introduces the Ten Commandments with is I am the God who brought you out of Egypt, out of, out of the land of slavery, right? I did this for you. And then later he talks about in Deuteronomy, not because you're a more numerous people or because you deserve this or did anything worthy of this whatsoever, but because I loved you. Because of him, not because of us. Yeah. All right. Well, we will stop there because we're out of time. Any final comments or questions? Yes. Oh, Colin, you, you to read yes, the what prayer. Pray, mm -hmm. pray uh, that, yeah. Remember each other uh, and support and strengthen each other and share our faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank and praise you that you sent your son to be the ultimate lawgiver and the ultimate judge of us, that you've not only relieved us from the burden of the law through yourself, but that you've also given us the ability to live out this wonderful gospel. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage us to, be, to bear witness of the gospel message to the world around us, to encourage each other, to give each other not only words of love, but words of faithfulness and trust, knowing that you will be with us, that you are true to your promise, that you will give us what we need to say, and that you have blessed us through your Son. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Finally back in it.